Hey everyone, I'm Robert Moss. I'm a PhD student at Stanford University, and today I want to talk about agents for safety critical applications. And so when I say agents really, I mean sequential decision makers. This includes autonomous systems and decision support tools, which ultimately provide recommendations to humans who make the final decision. And for safety critical applications, these are cases where we want to minimize system failures. So this includes maximizing human well-being and safety. This includes safeguarding financial assets, as well as protecting infrastructure, which includes nature. And for agents, this comes in many different forms. Uh, this could be vehicles, like autonomous vehicles here showing a Tesla. This could also be transportation vehicles, like semi-trucks. Uh, or it could even be commercial aircraft, or helicopters, or hobby drones, or even uh, large military drones. Uh, agents also come in the form of robots uh, for manufacturing or medical applications. Uh, agents come in the form of machinery. This could be kind of large drills for uh, drilling operations, for subsurface exploration, or even just observation uh, machinery uh, in terms of those applications, as well as just simply computers. These could be computer systems for financial asset management, or also just computer systems that operate purely in a digital setting. One of the main application areas I want to talk today about is aviation safety. So we've worked on aircraft collision avoidance systems. These are systems on board that provide guidance to pilots to either climb or descend away from intruding aircraft. Uh, I'm going to talk about autonomous cargo aircraft as well, uh, that autonomously fly to transport cargo. Uh, we've worked on airborne wildfire suppression uh, that autonomously can uh, allocate resources on active wildfires. And we've also worked on autonomous drone delivery uh, in order to deliver packages door-to-door. Uh, -door. Uh, so this talk, I'll focus on these three aviation safety applications. Another application area is safe autonomous navigation. So as mentioned, this could be just your self-driving cars. Uh, this could also be space exploration rovers, which we've done work on. Uh, this could be autonomous haul trucks for large, say, mining operations uh, where these trucks have to interact with uh, both humans and large materials uh, in, a, in a very safety critical setting. As well as warehouse robots, which could be kind of your Amazon settings uh, or just a factory setting that uh, operate both with humans and with uh, other machinery. Uh, this talk, I'll focus quickly on self-driving car safety as well as uh, space exploration rovers. Another safety critical application area would be financial and cyber security. Uh, so this includes uh, agents for stock trading, uh, agents for asset management, agents for cyber uh, attack defense, as well as uh, fraud detection. I won't cover any of these uh, in any more detail in this talk, but you can see the citations for more details. And the last application area I want to talk about is safe geological sustainability. So we've done work on groundwater remediation, which is how do you pump and treat uh, subsurface groundwater uh, in order to remove pollutants. Uh, we've done work on carbon capture and storage. So how do you capture carbon from the air or from factories and uh, store those in uh, porous mediums in the subsurface? Uh, we've done critical mineral exploration applications uh, where we drill to uh, understand what the uh, ore of a critical mineral would be in the subsurface uh, in order to mine or abandon that plot of land. Uh, and finally, we are currently working on some geothermal energy production applications where how can we optimally place uh, injector and uh, pr uh, production wells in order to get uh, geothermal energy out of the ground. Uh, this talk will focus uh, briefly on the final two application areas here. So you might be asking yourself, how do all of these problems relate to one another? Well, they're all sequential decision-making problems that start in some state of the world at time step t. As an example, I'll use the autonomous driving problem, which the state of the world could represent the position and velocity of the vehicle. And we have a safety goal of avoiding an obstacle here, shown as the cone. So what we'd want to do is we want to find an action that correctly avoids that obstacle. And in doing so, we would get some reward at time step t. The reward could be positive if we correctly avoid the obstacle. It could be slightly negative if we hit it here as a cone. And it could be a large penalty if we veer off the road. So once we have the action, we want to take the action and transition to a new state at time t plus 1. And then we can continue this process into the future for the next time step. And we could look at all possible actions from this new state. And we can even further continue that uh, into the future for the state t plus 2. As you can see, this process will expand exponentially the further we look into the future. So this process we call the Markov decision process. Now the problem with applying MDPs to real world problems is the fact that we can't actually observe the true state of the world. And so this is actually hidden to us. 
And so here we can use the partially observable Markov decision process, where the partial observability is over the states, to actually get observations of the true world. And here this could be, say, some position and velocity measurements through GPS or LIDAR. And then we can use those observations to update our belief of where we think we are in the world. And so as a representative example, uh, updating our belief we'd call state estimation, how we can estimate the state we're in. Here we show some initial belief B0, which is a probability distribution over the states we think we're in. Say we get some observations from the real world, which could be some sensor measurements. And then we want to update our belief to get an understanding of where we think we are in the world. Uh, and this would be shown as this belief in blue on the left. And now our goal would be is to take the best action from any given belief. So if we're in this particular uh, belief of the world, we'd want to veer to the left. If we're in this particular case, we want to continue forward. And if we're in this particular case, we want to stop at the stop sign. So now that we've framed our problem as a POMDP, the solution to this problem would be to find a policy that maps beliefs to actions. Now our objective becomes finding an action that maximizes the reward. But really, we want to find a policy that maximizes the reward, where an action comes from that policy, given a belief B. We want to do this to find the discounted reward, so that we can discount future actions given our current time t. So we do this over the infinite horizon to discount those future rewards. But ultimately, we want to find this in expectation, so we can maximize the expected discounted future reward, where the components of the objective are shown here. So again, the solution is to use algorithms to find the optimal policy pi that maps beliefs B to actions A. And now we'll switch to applications of POMDPs in safety critical domains, here talking about aircraft collision avoidance systems. Aircraft collision avoidance systems are onboard systems that will provide guidance maneuvers for pilots to either climb or descend away from intruding aircraft. As you can see on the right, this shows a vertical rate indicator where there's the intruding aircraft at 200 feet below. Once aircraft get into a certain separation, uh, they'll be issued a traffic advisory to tell the pilot to look out the window to provide situational awareness, and more importantly, to be prepared for potential resolution advisories to take. So as the encounter progresses forward, if the threat is deemed to be unsafe, then the pilot will receive an action uh, to either climb or descend. And in this case, because the, the aircraft is below the own ship, uh, it gets a climb advisory. And here in the green, it's gonna show the vertical rate that the system wants the pilot to achieve. So the pilot will pull back on the stick to achieve this vertical rate. So right now it's up at about 500 feet per minute, um, and then it's about 1,000 feet per minute, and ultimately it wants to get to about 1,500 feet per minute vertical rate. And as you can see, the separation between the aircraft is uh, increasing, so now it's 600 feet and 700 feet. Uh, once the separation is deemed safe, uh, then the system will tell the pilot to level off uh, and go back to its previous vertical rate. Now the problem with collision avoidance systems is that we have to predict into the future uh, over the dynamics of the aircraft and the pilot response models, not only of the own ship aircraft, but also of all intruding aircraft as well, which can be extremely computationally expensive and it's an extremely large space to search over. Now some of the challenges of aircraft collision avoidance systems is that we have state uncertainty. So we have imperfect sensor information, which leads to this uncertainty in position and velocity of the aircraft. We have model uncertainty, which is the variability in pilot behavior, which makes it difficult to predict future trajectories of the aircraft. We also have multiple objectives. We want to balance both safety and operational considerations. And so the decision framework we use here is a POMDP. So the components of the POMDP for aircraft collision avoidance are broken down first into the state of the world. So this could be things like the altitude, the vertical rate, uh, the turn rate, and things like time to collision. But we can't actually observe the state, so we get these observations or measurements from the real world. This could be measurements of the uh, position via GPS or ADSB, and also uh, radar and things like altimeters to get altitude measurements. Using those observations, we can construct a belief. Here we use a Kalman filter to construct a Gaussian belief over these state variables. Using the belief, we can take actions. So these would be maneuver guidance to the pilot, whether to climb, level off, or descend. Once we take those actions, then we transition the problem forward using the aircraft dynamics as well as the pilot response models. And then lastly, we get some reward for transitioning. So this could be, say, some cost for a collision, uh, which would be our safety objective, as well as, say, cost for alerting, which is our operational suitability objective, because we don't want to alert uh, all the time so the pilots lose trust in the system. And so as a reminder, once we frame the problem as a POMDP, now we want to find a policy that maps beliefs to actions. As an example, here's a policy of the aircraft collision avoidance system. 
uh, where the relative altitude is on the y-axis and the time to potential collision is on the x-axis. And the intruder is, is located there at zero, zero. This is all relative space. So this is intuitive, right? If we're above the intruder, then we want to climb. And if we're below the intruder, we want to descend. And something interesting about this result is the fact that you can see the notch here in uh, the left-hand side of the uh, colored plot. Uh, and this is actually saying we want to wait to get more information as we get closer to the intruder in order to break the tie between climb and descent. So now we'll talk about another aviation application, which is the safety of autonomous cargo aircraft. So as an example, the autonomous aircraft company X-Wing operates a fully autonomous Cessna caravan that will transport cargo across the United States. The idea is that this is a fully autonomous stack that can fly gate to gate without a pilot, but each of those components uh, that makes up the autonomy is not necessarily using AI. And one of the application areas where AI is extremely useful uh, is in processing images in order to detect or classify certain objects. And one of those subcomponents would be the runway detection in order to augment GPS information. Uh, here's an example of the runway detector in action where we have the aircraft coming in uh, on an approach to land and it's using GPS information and the camera feed in order to uh, fuse those sensor information to get a more accurate position of the aircraft as it lands. But the problem here is we want to ensure the safety of this in order to test its probability of failure, um, but we want, don't want to do this in flight. So what we use is we use simulation so we can generate images of, say, nominal runway conditions. We can generate images of off-nominal runway conditions here showing a flight at night. Uh, we can generate less frequent weather conditions as well as uh, test in possibly dangerous to fly scenarios that we wouldn't want to actually flight test. And so the idea of this problem is we have a black box decision maker. Uh, here, this could be the runway detector. This could be a sequential decision maker. Um, but the whole idea is that we have some input that we feed into the system, and it produces some output that tells us whether or not that input led to a failure. So now the problem will take those outputs, uh, whether or not they led to failure, and it will construct some probabilistic surrogate model, which is just a fancy way to say, using those data points, we can fit a model to predict where we would fail. Here showing green where we uh, actually succeed in detecting the runway and red is where we fail. And then the question is, how do we select new points in order to better fit this surrogate over our operating domain? And so we've developed a Bayesian safety validation approach uh, that will select these new points using certain objectives. The first objective is called uncertainty exploration, which explores the design space to minimize uncertainty. Uh, and it will use that point uh, as input into the black box decision maker. The next objective is to refine the failure boundary in order to get a better understanding of where we fail. And the third objective is we want to sample from the predicted failure regions so we can produce more failures with higher likelihood. So all three of those points we would evaluate into the decision-making system to refit our probabilistic surrogate model. Now, as an illustration for this particular problem of runway detection, uh, we can see on the x-axis we have the distance to runway, and on the y-axis we have the glide slope angle in terms of degrees. So we parameterize our image space into these uh, two-dimensional domain. And as an example, this particular uh, distance to runway and glide slope angle uh, produced a success, so it correctly detected the runway. And this particular glide slope and distance to runway produced a failure uh, here shown in red. And now with this probabilistic surrogate model, we can use it to get an estimate of the probability of failure using important sampling. Now showing results of applying the Bayesian safety validation approach to the runway detection system in simulation, we can show that we get a probability of failure of about 6 times 10 to the minus 3, and this is only over 999 data points of the true system. If we instead sample directly from the operational models, uh, we would expect about six out of a thousand of these samples to lead to failure, but here we show we get about 600 failures. As we can see in the bottom right figure C, we converge to a probability of failure estimate in about 400 samples, and figure B shows that we're finding more samples with higher likelihood. So now I'm going to talk about airborne wildfire suppression. So here we've done work both on wildfire resource allocation as well as wildfire surveillance. As motivation, this New York Times article shows that 2020 was the most active fire year on record for the West Coast. So this is an extremely important problem. But the difficulty with wildfire suppression, especially uh, aerial wildfire suppression, is the pilots are put in very dangerous conditions in order to suppress the wildfire. And as a, a more illustrative example of a real world case, uh, here we can see that not only are there pilots extremely close to one another in order to uh, extinguish this fire, 
but they're also put in really dangerous conditions in terms of visibility uh, and, and of course separation. But what this video really highlights is the fact that these pilots are flying very close to the ground and as you can see here very close to population. So this is a very safety critical case. One of the problems with wildfire resource management is just understanding where the wildfire is spreading. And here we can apply POMDPs in order to send UAVs out to actually fly the airspace in order to understand the, the spread of the wildfire. The second problem is in wildfire resource allocation itself. This is where do we allocate the suppression resources in order to extinguish the wildfire. So this is an extremely large problem because there's a lot of uncertainty in the dynamics of the wildfire. And also we have to plan over a long horizon in order to make the optimal decision. And so what we've done is we provided a decision support tool to wildfire incident commanders in order to recommend where to place water. So the POMDP for the wildfire resource allocation can be broken down into its states, which the state of the world are the areas in which we're burning, the fuel levels, which here I mean fuel as in the fuel from the terrain, so how much uh, terrain is left in order to burn, uh, the elevation, which fire actually spreads faster uphill, and so we want to understand that, as well as areas where there could be population. Because we can't observe the states directly, we get measurements uh, through observations. Uh, and one way you can do this is through image surveillance, either both manned or unmanned aircraft. With those observations, you can construct a belief about the uncertainty in the fuel of the terrain, as well as the uncertainty in the random wildfire spread itself. Using the beliefs, you can take actions uh, as an example of where to drop these aerial suppressants. Once you drop the suppressants, uh, you can apply that, which is not guaranteed, to suppress the fire. And also you want to uh, transition the wildfire spread uh, forward. And then finally, you have some rewards, which you have some cost for any active fire. So you want just the fire to be fully suppressed. And also you have a, a, a large penalty for any population that is affected by the wildfire. Now switching gears to the road. So one of the problems we've worked on is autonomous vehicle risk assessment. So in this problem, we want to stress test the autonomous vehicle policies, which make sequential decisions in the real world. But we don't want to do this actually in the real world because this could put human lives at risk. So what we do is we actually do this in simulation where we can simulate the autonomous vehicle policy, but we really want, we want to do this faster than real time so we can get this more efficiently. So we can frame this problem as a POMDP, where the actions of this POMDP are disturbances applied to the sensors in order for us to find likely failures. As an example, Here's a camera sensor for an autonomous vehicle policy where we apply noise, but we don't find a failure. And here's another example applying sensor noise to the camera where in fact we do find a failure. So another autonomous navigation problem we worked on is lunar rover exploration with NASA Ames. So this problem is fascinating. And so the idea here is there are areas of the moon uh, that they call permanently shadowed regions or PSRs. Uh, these permanently shadowed regions uh, do not get any sun, so they're permanently shadowed. And there's a possibility that there's actually ice deposits left over from asteroids that actually hit those and created those craters. And so the idea is we want to now construct a, an autonomous rover to traverse the moon in order to maximize its scientific discovery uh, as it explores those permanently shadowed regions. So NASA's Viper mission is sending a rover to the moon in order to traverse the moon to make decisions on where to drill to collect information about whether or not there is water deposits. This traversal was generated using a POMDP, and the idea is it'll select where to drill and collect that information as samples to then further be analyzed. The rover is put into some extremely dangerous conditions in terms of elevation, and also has to make decisions on where to stop based on communication loss with the ground station. The idea is this is an example traverse where it's generating where to go in order to maximize the scientific output of the rover being on the moon, ultimately to find those areas where there's potential for water to be on the moon. And now a similar problem we've applied POMDPs to is critical mineral exploration. So the idea with critical mineral exploration is we have some state of the world, which is just some subsurface ore where we have some quality of that ore that we can't actually observe directly. Uh, but we can make observations uh, by drilling into the ground and observing you know, the, the ore quality itself. Here we can construct a belief over this ore quality, uh, which is really just sort of some blurry understanding of what's in the subsurface given our observations. Using that belief, we can select a next action, which could be a location to drill at to get more observations, and then ultimately a final decision on whether to mine or abandon this ore. 
There are no transition dynamics in this problem, but uh, as an example for, say, carbon capture and storage, at this point you would transition, say, the carbon flow in the subsurface or the geothermal energy production, which I'll show later. This could be, say, running some reservoir simulator. And in this problem, the rewards are sort of multifaceted. So we have some reward that's based on how much ore we extract. And so this is minus some, say, economic threshold for extraction. Uh, and also there's a cost for drilling because we don't want to just drill everywhere. And there's actually some real world cost to setting up a drill and operating a drill. So now I've talked about a lot of examples of POMDPs and safety critical applications, and mainly these real world problems. And well, now I want to switch gears and talk about algorithms we've developed for these long horizon sequential problems. And here we've applied this to the critical mineral exploration problem. So the problem with long horizon planning is the fact that if we start in some initial belief here in the circle nodes, uh, we want to find some action and then transition to a new belief. But if we do this exhaustively, you can see how the tree kind of expands exponentially. And this is just for two beliefs and two actions at each time step. And Realistically, beliefs are uh, continuous because they're a probability distribution over states, so we can't actually exhaustively search the full space. So one of our goals is to reduce the breadth of the search so we only prioritize actions and not try all of the actions, uh, knowing, say, some prior information on what actions are uh, important. And other goals, we want to reduce the depth of the search so we don't have to search too deep in order to get some information, but can we get some, say, estimate of what the future would be if we stopped and continued forward? And so now the combined goal is to reduce both breadth and depth of the search. And here we develop an algorithm that's based on alpha zero, which is an algorithm that's beat the world champion of Go. The idea is we want to select actions that uh, we've previously seen that give us some high reward. And so we can prioritize our breadth of the search in blue. And also we want to predict the future here using some value of the future. And we do this through neural network training. And so that way we don't have to search over the entire tree. We just focus on areas of the tree and of the future that are promising. So the algorithm we develop for belief state planning is called beta zero. The idea is you start with some initial network, uh, given some belief, this will output the probability distribution over what actions to take, as well as some value of the future if you were at that belief. With the initial network, then you want to now evaluate that network. Uh, and so you do policy evaluation by running, say, n parallel tree search simulations. So this online tree search will iteratively run these four steps that I'm about to show. The first step is starting from, say, an initial belief. Uh, and you will say, sample an action using the policy head of your network here, p theta. Uh, you will expand on that action by progressing the POMDP forward. You will simulate the future using the value head of the network in order to predict what's the value of the future from that point on. And then you will back propagate that information so that next time you repeat the step, either you select a new action using the policy head, uh, P theta, or you can uh, sample from the existing actions uh, using things like upper confidence trees. So once you evaluate the policy, you'll collect uh, a bunch of data uh, from these online tree search runs. You'll retrain your existing neural network, and we call this policy improvement. And then you update your current network, and you will repeat this process. Um, and this is a policy iteration process in order to get a better policy until you converge. Now showing some beta zero results for the mineral exploration problem. What I'm showing here is the plot of the uncertainty of the subsurface, uh, where the high uncertainty is in yellow. And the idea is each of these vertical bars is the probability that this particular policy would select that action. So existing solutions you can see sort of have a uniform policy uh, because there's not a lot of information it can get uh, from just its limited search. But when you apply beta zero, you can see that the areas in which beta zero are focusing on are those areas with high uncertainty so that it can reduce its understanding in order to make a final decision on whether to mine or abandon. And what's nice is that these were learned without inputting any heuristics that this is what the problem should focus on. And this matches previous work where the heuristic of the existing solutions uh, was to first select actions where there's high uncertainty. So here we're showing that beta zero can generalize to various POMDPs, uh, focusing here on long horizon problems. But the idea is that beta zero will learn to replace heuristics with these approximations. And as you can see, beta zero performs extremely well on both standard POMDP benchmarks, as well as the real-world mineral exploration case. 
So why does this all matter? Well, here we want to separate problem from solution, where the problem we can frame as a POMDP, or a partially observable Markov decision process, which is a formal framework for sequential decision making under uncertainty. The solution would be to uh, apply general algorithms for large scale planning, where we can learn from experience to replace these handcrafted heuristics. And what's nice is this is applicable across seemingly unrelated domains, where applying it to safety critical problems really require planning under uncertainty. And some ongoing research is to uh, develop safety aware planning algorithms in order to use information about safety considerations as we plan, as opposed to just balancing out different large costs. And some ongoing applications too are things like geothermal energy production. And I'll quickly talk about the geothermal energy production POMDP here. So the idea is there's some state of the world, which is say the porosity, permeability, depth or temperature of the subsurface. We get some observations um, by drilling, so we can get some porosity and permeability measurements. We're here the porosity and permeability uh, measure how porous the uh, subsurface material actually is. We can also get measurements at existing wells, uh, which is things like the bottom hole pressure and temperature. Using those observations, we can construct a belief, which are just probability distributions over our state variables. From those beliefs, we can select actions. And in this geothermal energy production problem, the actions we could uh, select would be to drill both injectors and producers, where we inject water and uh, produce uh, hot water. We could also change those injection rates at existing wells, and also just collect measurements uh, by observing you know, uh, the bottom hole pressure or bottom hole temperature at existing wells. From there, we can transition the simulation forward using a, a computationally heavy reservoir simulator. We're also doing work on using surrogate models to replace these simulators. And then finally, there's some reward where we have discounted net present value, as well as there's some cost to actually drilling a well, um, which is relative to the distance to say that center uh, surface location, as well as some small cost to change the injection rate. And as a safety consideration, there's a hard constraint on minimizing the probability of earthquake given uh, the drills. So thank you very much. And if you have any other questions, feel free to email me or reach out.